Hello, everyone. A very good evening. Thank you for sticking around for our panel. Um, welcome aboard, lady and gentlemen. Uh, looking forward to a very, very interesting discussion with you. I'm not going to give um, a large introduction to what we are speaking on. I mean, uh, the topic itself is very descriptive. Um, creativity, um, in a sense, have uh, driven human evolution um, all along the way. But since the um, evolution or, or the emergence of the technological era or the digital era, the question remains whether technology has gone beyond uh, creativity. Um, and this is something that we are going to touch upon today with diverse perspectives coming in from our panelists, um, representing very different sectors of creativity uh, of their own. So my first question, I think, goes to Ravine. Um, Ravin has his roots in digital entertainment, digital community building, and web development, and has founded two digital entertainment companies, and currently is also the president of Esports Association of Sri Lanka, where he's spearheading esports adoption here um, in our country. Ravin, firstly, what was it like for you in disrupting a very strong-rooted platform as uh, traditional sports here in Sri Lanka, and how has the journey been for you? Sure. Okay, so basically I'm Ravin Vijaytalaka, uh, CEO of Gamer.lk and currently the president of the Sri Lanka Esports Association. Um, our journey has been uh, one of 11 years. So it's been 11 years since we started uh, Gamer.lk and it has been a phenomenal journey in terms of how it has grown from something very minor. This is a pre-Facebook era uh, where, when we started to today when it has uh, basically uh, created communities and uh, movements in esports and digital entertainment. In 2007, it was myself and a couple of friends <coughs> who basically, you know, were looking at the international scene, seeing what's happening there, and we got together and started what we called a discussion forum online uh, to talk about games uh, and like-minded activities. That turned into basically us playing the games as well as wanting to you know, compete against other people. And we were seeing this happening internationally. In, in of course, this is 10 years ago, it was happening in a small way. But we, want, we saw that and we really wanted to get involved in it. And so we, we started things called weekend gaming where it was basically hosted on uh, local servers, like uh, servers at home where 10 or 20 people used to connect and play against each other. So that was the birth of basically the esports scene in Sri Lanka. You fast forward 10 years, and we have large scale events. Uh, I think we, we filled the BMICH. Last year we had it at the Sri Lanka Exhibition and Cent uh, Convention Center, SLECC. We have about 3,000 people taking part in esports, and about 25,000 people coming to watch the games uh, and take part in all the activities over the three day period. So, <coughs> Basically, we are looking at a complete shift in how um, millennials are looking at traditional sports. You see viewership uh, declining for traditional sports like the NFL, uh, even the FIFA World Cup this year. There was a bit of a dip uh, for various reasons. But you see tr uh, digital entertainment and esports is on the rise. Um, if you look at uh, the NFL, by 2020, esports viewership is going to exceed uh, the number of people who actually watch uh, events like the NFL. And that's a significant uh, achievement. And if you look at the numbers, that's a significant number to actually go and uh, present to even a sponsor or a different community. Uh, yeah, so in terms of uh, the association, we have now in Sri Lanka being recognized as an official sport. So the Asian Games is happening uh, at the end of August, where esports is being recognized as a demonstration sport. And in 2020, um, Asian Games, it will be a recognized official medal event. That means Sri Lankans can go to the Asian Games and actually win a medal for playing games. So that's a significant achievement in terms of uh, what we've been doing for the last 10 years. So in order to achieve that, we actually had been lobbying the National Olympic Committee for the last four years 
we've been telling them, look, esports is a force to be reckoned with. You know, there are so many people actually watching the games. Um, internationally, it's being recognized in, as an official sport. And uh, this year, we actually broke through and they gave us full support to actually send the team to the South Asian qualifiers, where one of our members actually won and they'll be representing the country at the end of August in, in, in Indonesia. So uh, that's, that has been a significant achievement for us. And uh, through that, we have actually been able to sp uh, speak to the sports ministry. And the sports ministry has also told us they'll be giving their support to recognize esports in Sri Lanka as an official sport. Uh, so actually, that's we are, where we are now. And it's basically a significant hyper growth uh, for esports and the whole digital entertainment scene in Sri Lanka as well moving forward. Thank you, Thank Ravi. You. And may I say, well done. <laughs> Thank you very much. Next, I turn to uh, Pradeepa, uh, Pradeepa Jeeva. Um, she made it big um, in the US. She worked with YouTube, Mish Cinema, and Warner Brothers as a producer. And now she's also moving into Africa for a new venture as a, as a social entrepreneur. And I'd like to hear your insights on how technology has evolved in areas of your work, I mean, um, the cross-pollination of the work that you do, actually, to address social issues, especially through creativity and creative industries. Thank you. I feel like I'm in a video game right now <laughs> with all this. Um, oh, my notes. So I want to start off with some numbers. Um, the creative economy is uh, almost $30 trillion. And about, there's about 25 million jobs that come from the creative economy. The issue is 80% of that, the narrative is held by white men. So one of the things that me and the companies that I work with have been trying to do is get more Asians, South Asians, and Africans into the creative economy and be able to um, benefit from that. And so one of the projects that I'm working on currently is we are gonna be going into Burkina Faso, which is in West Africa. And for the next nine months, we're gonna be piloting a program where we're gonna mobilize about 500 young people and hire 100 young people and teach them how to be at the center of their messaging, produce the content that they are um, gonna develop, and then teach them how to actually distribute that content throughout West Africa. Um, so it's always, in, in, my, in my career and in my trajectory over the past 15 years, uh, I have worked in studios, I have worked with some of the biggest gamers and influencers on the planet, um, and a lot of the, the stories that I'm telling and the stories that I'm consuming and the people that I'm working with and answering to don't look like me and don't look like you guys. And that's why something like Disrupt Asia is so exciting and I love that this is happening. I love seeing Sri Lankan people being so involved in the creation of their own messaging and um, becoming entrepreneurs and creating tech solutions for uh, local issues and problems. Um, so, you know, I started out in the industry, uh, part of the YouTube original content initiative. So about eight years ago, YouTube um, had a $100 million budget to play with. And they uh, split that budget up uh, amongst 100 channels on YouTube to see if they could have the market share that Netflix had to create original content. Um, so it was, I wouldn't say it was a failed experiment, but it was an experiment. They got a lot of learnings out of it. And now we see things like YouTube Premium, YouTube Red, um, that, and some of their shows are doing pretty well. Uh, but, um, and I think th that digi the digital space is constantly disrupting traditional media, traditional films, traditional television. And it's being done so because the, the barrier to entry is it's, it's open, there, it's, it's, it's open access, right? Back in the day, even just eight years ago, to be able to distribute your content, it was impossible. You would have to go to a studio, you would have to go to a publisher, and you would, it's like winning the lottery, right? And so now, if you have a camera or if you have a cell phone, you can distribute your content, you can tell your story, and you can broadcast and amplify your messaging. And so it, what's really exciting, cutting forward, going to um, Burkina Faso is, it's, it's, uh, n it's not developed at all. There's, there's a lot of room to come in and provide low-tech solutions that can be adapted quickly and people will be able to leapfrog into that technology and use, use these learnings and use the access to resource and tools that we're hoping to provide 
to really um, solve problems within their community, to bring access and resources to people in their family and to their peers. Um, so yeah, so I would say like right now, after working at you know Warner Brothers and YouTube's and with some of the bigger uh, uh, gamers in the space, that you know I'm what I'm really interested in seeing is how we can come together and hack hack issues together by using technology and storytelling and being able to really disrupt the system so people are all playing on an equal field. Excellent, thank you, Pradeepa. I'm going to um, take a point that you made and direct it directly to Yudanje on supply chains in creative industries. Yudanje, as all of you may know, is uh, an Amazon best-selling author and a blogger with a collection of mixed experiences from media to marketing, not only based here on the ground, but um, all the way across to the valley itself. So Yudha, tell us um, your perspectives on how technology can reinvent the value chains, especially in creative content, and how it has disrupted or can disrupt um, supply chains of creative industries. Right. Thanks, Randala. So um, a little bit of backstory, I'm a writer. Yes, I'm a researcher, but my core has been and always will be a writer. So I write science fiction. So somewhere in 2015, I wrote this book called Numbercast. Uh, it was about algorithmic societies and so on and so forth. I won't bore you with the details, but I wanted to get that out. Now, my options at the time were either I go to a couple of publishers here in Sri Lanka, or I do the thing where I pay, um, I do a print run, I set it up at Barefoot or something, I get my friends to come, I take some photos, I hashtag I'm an author now. Or there was this thing that people started talking to me about called Amazon. Um, and I sat there and I sort of thought about this for a few months. And then I went and I gave it to a couple of publishers here. And they said, well, are you crazy? Nobody's going to read science fiction in Sri Lanka. The market doesn't exist. So I thought, okay, that's one option down. And I thought about the other two options, which are basically paying money, printing it, uh, or you know, figuring out how to turn this into an ebook. And I realized that what tech has done is, as long as a creative product is tied to something physical, see, it might be a book, it might be a CD, it might be a DVD with your movie on it, as long as it's tied to something physical, you're going to face issues of warehousing and distribution. You're going to want to stockpile, you're going to want to ship things. And where you have such a problem, what's going to happen is you're going to see massive investments going to a few entities that basically control the channel. And you get gatekeepers. So they decide, and they're publishers, they're record labels, they are basically, I mean, even Warner Brothers at a time, right? And what has happened is it started with the music industry, I would say, where MP3s took over and suddenly nobody is going into shops and buying CDs anymore. And we have Netflix with DVDs. Uh, we have Amazon with eBooks. What's happened is technology has completely the creation of a digital product, something that doesn't have to have a physical medium, has completely taken this entire ecosystem out of the picture. I wouldn't say it's completely destroyed. People will buy music in stores. Uh, people, but pe more people will be watching movies on Netflix. So I realized, okay, I can be read from Colombo to Colombia in a second, I put this thing out, I figured out how to do it, I work with designers, I work with people who understand this platform, and I'm suddenly international, I'm not even confined to Sri Lanka anymore, and that book did spectacularly well. And then I realized, I got in touch with a lot of other author friends, a lot of other creators, and I realized now the game had shifted, it is not shifting, it already has shifted. When you take that distribution channel out, when you take gatekeepers out of the picture, you enable a lot more people to be creative. You enable them to get their stuff out there. So what's gonna happen is now you have a flooded market. You have a huge amount of supply. There's limited demand on the other end. And then the game shifts to platforms because now suddenly it's about how do I find the best science fiction book or how do I find the best romance? That is, and that gives way to basically Amazon, the Kindle store. It gives rise to Spotify, to Netflix, which are all basically solving that problem of discovery. So. Basically, what's happened with tech for a lot of these creative industries, for a lot of the industries that I'm in, is that the fight has changed. We no longer have to, well, disclaimer, I do have a contract with HarperCollins as well, but a lot of the creatives, a lot of the authors coming out, some of the finest writers I know, no longer have to worry about 
collecting 200 rejections and putting them on a paper nail or somewhere. They don't have to worry about finding an agent and you know, getting a manuscript out there. They have to worry about what is Amazon's algorithm going to do to this? Are there a lot of people searching for this category? Is Amazon going to recommend these through emails to readers? How do I figure out where my potential readers are? So there is, there is basically a connection between the consumer and the creator. And now the challenge is basically how do we acquire as much data as possible on the people reading our books and how do we market to them better? Thank you, Danja. I think you um, gave a very solid direction to the second round of questions. I'm going to come to that um, after I uh, speak to Sugi. Um, Sugi is the managing director and head of brands at Magic Mango. Um, he started his advertising career very young and have now come full circle having his own agency. And also as the, uh, the president of the four years in Sri Lanka, the accredited advertising agencies association. Um, so Sugi, when we talk about the advertising industry, now we spoke about books and um, online content and sports and advertising, if I, if I may say so, is like the godfather of all of this. Um, how do you see the industry disruption from Mad Men era, if I may say so, to now? Has the advertising industry here in Sri Lanka embraced technology and its evolution with open arms? How do you see it? I, I think I can bet my not money which I don't have right now, that there wouldn't be even 10 people from that industry here. I'm sure about that. And that is the answer for that. Because uh, they don't, uh, I don't think they know there's a thing like this happening even. So in, in, in 2002, when I started advertising at Grand McKenna Erickson, um, I think I just caught the last stages of the Mad Men era. Where, where things were really cool, uh, clients really respected your ideas, they paid you some good money, uh, you had a lot of parties, you drank a lot, um, and then you, had, you made more money. And then, while this whole disruption started happening, I don't know, no fault of uh, agency heads maybe at that time, just uh, sat away, uh, did not uh, want to change things at that time, and uh, did not embrace it. And you fast forward to 2018, 18, uh, 16 years later, this topic is what is driving conversation in the industry everywhere. So I was at Can two months ago. This was the exact topic everywhere. But what has happened globally is that agencies have changed their model to support disruption in tech. You know, so. Uh, but you even still see in, 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 in big uh, multinational agencies globally that um, there is a sense of uh, refraining towards the tech side because uh, if Cannes is called Festival of Creativity, the big name uh, creative guy w was talking at a session and he said, is this a festival of tech? You know, I don't see creativity here. And then there's a bunch of guys all very young, talking about AI and bots and stuff and how they're doing new work with uh, creative work. And they were all looking cool stuff. Execution has become so damn cool in the creative world. And it's like, wow, wow, that's, that's amazing. I, I would want to do that. And you come back to Sri Lanka and I was so pumped. You're like, I'm going to do this shit, man. I'm going to do this. I'm going to talk to my clients. I'm going to talk to my agencies because as the president of four years, you need to talk to all the agencies and say, okay, guys, we need to change this, you know. But this, this is not working out. What do we do? Nothing. Uh, nothing happens. So, um, so that's the problem. So that colliding of these two industries need to happen now, here. And when that happens, I was just talking to him I mean, about gaming. Back in the day, uh, an agency is the one who they come to, you know. The, gaming community will come to and talk about uh, how do we take this across and stuff like that. He never called me. I don't think he called any agency. He's doing it on his own. That's how technology has helped people do shit, you know? So, and even for you, books and stuff. I don't think, um, I mean, maybe you would have got a freelancer or a designer to design it, but you never came to an agency to talk about how you want stuff, to, you know, designed and all that. So, uh, it's, 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 uh, there, there's no question about whether it has disrupted, it has. Um, globally, agencies are 
or changing their models. Um, fewer agencies in Sri Lanka are doing it, uh, and they're very successful. Um, and and um, I think it's time for us to collide and do it. And if not for a speaker, I was anyway planning to come here to just see and understand maybe there is a lack of knowledge about this ecosystem. Um, and back in the day, we were the cool ones. We were really cool. Advertising was the coolest job. You guys told away all the cool, man. Look oh, at your yeah, offices. Yeah. Look at this space. Look at what you guys are doing. You know, so it's damn cool to be right now uh, in, this, uh, in this moment of time. And I think uh, like your ecosystem of startups and all is going, going into uh, different realms, I think, uh, I think uh, our industry also will do something, otherwise they're going to die. Thank you, Sugei. Um, I could say welcome to the cool side back again, so you crossed over officially. <laughs> Um, since we spoke about, okay, I'm tied between two topics now, whether I go to Jiva or Ravin first, but um, let's just stick to the uh, um, uh, way we started. Ravin, I'll come back to you. Um, we spoke about gaming um, and how human interaction and gaming works. How do we pursue the right um, blend of artificial intelligence, AI, um, and human creativity? Can you relate to this in a gaming perspective, especially here? Sure. So um, one thing I realized is esports. I, di I didn't actually explain what esports is. So esports is the competitive play of video games. So you have maybe one person uh, versus another person taking part in some sort of video game. It may be FIFA. It may be a shooting game. Maybe a racing game. Um, and so that's uh, the competitive mode of it. It's not casual play. It's the competitive side of it. So how AI really gets involved is there are a couple of ways that artificial intelligence makes its way to esports. Uh, one is AI can actually play the game. So there are programmers who will develop bots, who will actually mimic humans, um, who will, so let's take an example of maybe Dota. Uh, it's a multiplayer online battle arena game where the bot will mimic each and every action that a human, human would otherwise uh, 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 perform on the battlefield. So sometimes there are instances where in matchmaking, where you join a game, you need to play against uh, five other humans. Maybe there is only four that you can find, so then AI takes the uh, fifth person's place. There is also uh, an initiative called OpenAI uh, that is funded by you know, Elon Musk, Microsoft, AWS. They have created artificial intelligence and these are, by the way, uh, Dota is a very complex game. Uh, there are, you know, so many variations. It's, it's chess on steroids, basically. So uh, last year, they developed an AI that could beat human players in this very complex game. Uh, so that's, that's one way that AI can actually get into esports. Uh, the other way is actually more interesting. Uh, it's analysis of uh, esports uh, consumer behavior. So uh, there, there is a startup called Fan AI that was funded in the US. They got like a two or three million dollar uh, funding round. What they do is they analyze what esports players and gamers, uh, what their consumer habits are, uh, what they buy in game, how they spend their money, and life events. And uh, based on AI, they will actually then uh, convey that information to sponsors. Uh, where brands will then take that information and market exactly what those consumers need. So, I mean, back in the day, you can speak to this. Uh, you'd, you'd understand what people were watching on TV by a, basically a physical survey, right? Uh, you'd, you'd understand how many people are watching your program or your advertisement based on physical surveys. We are in, a, in an era that AI can actually <clears throat> understand what type of person you are and how many of your type of person uh, is actually watching these games. Uh, the other ways are, of course, we have, uh, and, and there's a lot of money behind this, uh, investments in training. So eSports players um, will train against bots. So there's another $5 million investment uh, that has gone into something called gosu.ai, uh, where they have built a platform where eSports athletes can train against bots. So there's a lot of money coming into this space 
uh, in terms of investments because in the next five years, the prediction is that um, esports is basically going to be in the top three sports of the world. Uh, by 2021, by 2024, it's uh, going to be in the Olympics. Uh, that's, I think we're about 90% there already. Uh, the Olympic, the International Olympic Committee has already had, actually it was this July, they had a, a conference on esports to basically uh, discuss the suitability of esports, uh, including it in the Olympics. Uh, and yeah, so there's a lot of investment uh, into this whole AI aspect of uh, how AI can get involved in esports from the branding side of things, from the sponsorship side, as well as the training and the, uh, the interaction of it. Thank you, Ravin. Um, I'm directly going to come to you, Danjaya, because I can build on to the topic of AI that way. Um, blending AI and creativity, Danjaya thinks is a stage too early. Um, would you like to expand on that and say well, how it can be clearer in the future? How could it be used better? So my, my thing is this, the whole AI debate right now, you have people who understand what they're doing, uh, going, there is no AI, we have machine learning, we have, uh, we have things like TensorFlow, we have narrow AI, which is highly domain specific. It can generally perform better than a human in that one particular domain. We don't have a general purpose artificial intelligence, so we, Skynet is not coming for our jobs. But now, 2016, a uh, Japanese, uh, a, t a team of researchers uh, at a Japanese university assembled something, a program, which basically put together a novel. And ironically, it was a novel about a computer writing a novel. That particular novel went on, uh, it was actually entered in, a, in one of the most prestigious Japanese literary awards, and it almost won. So what I'm looking at, again, it's not pure AI functioning. It's AI plus human. So what I'd like to look at is the field of chess. Now, chess, when Gary Kasparov gotten beaten by Deep Blue, Chess is a field that has historically had a lot of time to deal with getting its ass kicked by AI. And right now, some of the best chess players, um, you know, a d decent chess engine will beat the best grandmasters, hands down. So what happened in chess was not, there is now this subfield called advanced chess, which has the best chess players on the planet. They're better than grandmasters, they're better than those chess engines, because they're not just chess engines, all grandmasters, they're actually humans plus chess engines. So how these guys play is a player, a human, will have up to five or six chess engines computing all possible moves, and then the human selects the best one. And they, it has been routinely proved that even a weak human chess player, coupled with some really strong uh, chess engines, can routinely defeat grandmaster level opponents. So I think that's the future. It's not AI versus humans. It's gonna be AI plus humans. Now, going back to the whole literary thing, uh, I thought, okay, someday uh, you can essentially feed a bunch of words. You can feed a novel into a machine learning uh, a model and basically generate something that will generate something like that in that style of writing. There's enough and more examples of people saying, I fed Harry Potter into an AI and look at what it generated. And there are these pages that kind of look like they were written by J.K. Rowling if J.K. Rowling was really drunk. Now, I'm hoping that this technology really improves in the next 10 years, because I don't have a lot of time left to live on this earth. What I'm going to do is figure out how to do this, feed my novels into it, and have that AI producing novels for all eternity. Let's give it five. Yeah, I get to live forever. It's very egotistic, but now it's possible. Thank you, Dajay. Um Pradeepa, I'm going to come to you. Um, you have extensive um, experience working with uh, reputed companies in the US. And uh, when we had the discussion earlier as we came here, you um, had a lot of interesting insights to share as to how companies use big data in terms of creating creative content uh, according to the demand of the users. Would you like to give us a bit of insight on that? Sure. Um, so I was heading development, uh, creative development for Machinima. Machinima is the oldest and uh, the oldest MCN uh, multi-channel network on YouTube. We have about 18 million subscribers. And uh, when I first came in to do creative development, I was reading, I was talking to influencers, I was paying attention to the games that were really popular, you know, talking to my business development team to see what we could license um, and uh, repurpose and recreate uh, for original content. 
Uh, but when I came back just this last year to Machinima, I was no longer um, talking to my business development team on what we were going to be licensing. I was talking to my business intelligence team that grew from three people three years ago to 35 people. Our business intelligence team is building out um, a new product called The Brain, where they're basically uh, using big data to understand who is watching the content that we're putting up and what else are they watching, what other platforms are they watching it on, and what are the intersections of other influencers that are also behaving the same way so they, we can do some shows that are cross collaborations. So for example, um, Ninja is probably the biggest uh, gamer in the world right now on Fortnite. And he, mo he predominantly streams on Twitch. He had 600,000 consecutive streams at one time. And that, I mean, the next person uh, to him is, that can't touch that number at all. Like he's, he's a phenomenon, he's a pop culture icon at this point, and an anomaly. Um, but we, are, we use big data to figure out what other platforms we can successfully put him on and if we can actually create original content around him and if it makes sense to do so. So just three years ago when I was at Machinima and Warner Brothers, when I was developing original content, I was reading magazines, I was reading books, I was having conversations, I was meeting with my development team. We were using uh, big data, but not to the extent that I'm using it now. Big data is completely influencing the trajectory of our, um, of our creative. Of, of the platforms that we're gonna live on, of the collaborations and the partnerships that we want to have as a studio. Um, so it's, it's really, I mean, you always have to have that human element. It's very important, right? That's, that's the magic, that's the creativity. But, uh, but big data is super influ influential. And just for, you know, about eight weeks ago, we were acquired by AT&T, uh, Warner Brothers was, in one of the biggest mergers. and they, when they came into our offices, all they wanted to talk to us was about, was about our business intelligence team and how to be able to apply data to content, for, uh, original content for mobile devices around the world. And so, you know, they they're, they're got way more excited about our big, the information that we have, as you said earlier, data is gold. So anything that you're doing, anything that you're creating, hold on to that data, because that's the most valuable piece of information right now. Everybody is, everybody's trying to get ha their hands on data because the more you know about your consumer, the more you know about how people are, are engaging with your content, the more, the more you can build around them and create for them. Um, but yeah, big data, yeah. keep that in mind. <laughs> Thank you, Pradeepa. I think there's a lot going on out there already um, that helps creative industries uh, to emerge out of um, where they are, but I don't think it's even heard of here. Uh, back at home in terms of these types of users, especially for uh, the creative industries. So on that note, I'd like to uh, come to you, Sugi, again. Um, on advertising industry, existing monetary structures, they're extremely old um, and pretty much still in use. And this is clearly a clash between the old age advertising um, structures and the new age digital platforms that needs to be used to address the common uh, modern day consumer. How, how is this clash going? How bad is it? And how can it be disrupted? Uh, that's uh, an that's uh, interesting question because, uh, I mean, it's crazy to uh, believe that every time you run an ad on TV, that the creative agency gets a 10% or a 12% you know, agency commission on that. So you just imagine the numbers on a 150 million or an 80 million uh, media plan, so agencies get a buttload of money. So that was good, so it's still good. But then with all this disruption, and I say, yeah, TV is not working, print is not working, radio is not working. So it's very easy to say it's not working. Yeah, it's clearly not working, that's fine. Then you put it onto digital, and then you're talking about content and all that. But then the agencies are not making money. So, and then you strike up these like um, retainer fees, 
And then the whole issue with retainer fees is that you take it for granted, right? you take a client for granted. So client is paying you a million bucks, you know that million bucks is coming, or two million bucks, is, you know that money is going to come. Your service towards the client is like average, and then the client and agency relationship gets like a bit literally disrupted. They say, yeah, you guys know the money is coming, no matter, so you know, no, 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 that's the work, no matter. Well, that sort of chats start coming in. Um, globally, obviously, uh, there are a lot of talks about how do you uh, get creative commission on digital work, which is like a huge uh, discussion. Um, I think even the big, uh, big multinational uh, spenders like Unilever and, and PNG are even questioning digital work right now. You know, it's, it's four seconds viewing of, you know, if you created a 30 second film or a digital film and then I've s the, your audience is only watching it for three seconds and it counts as a view, am I only, you know, so where's the money going? So a lot of conversations like that is coming up. And then the whole issue on digital about ad blocking has risen to about 30% year on year. Um, uh, skip ads have just increased about double the time on that. So even the di digital side of advertising is also getting questioned. So I'm sure even in time to come, there will be um, a lot of um, regulations on that, which would help um, advertising agencies uh, work much better with uh, clients to determine how they spend their money. So, but I think uh, TV is still going to stay for some time. Um, bad advertising is dead. Uh, we do a lot of that. Uh, um, so um, um, that's the problem. So if you do good ads, and if you still put it on TV, and you can still do, it, you know, you can get pretty much a decent job. Bad advertising is dead for sure. So um, and then and then uh, the issue is about. Um, so you couple it with digital. You do it on TV. You obviously sometimes your ex uh, entertainment value and the experience is not that great. So you combine it with digital. Uh, but you keep TV. But the thing is this, in Sri Lanka, if you look at our TV programs, the shit, right? It's really bad. So people need to, you know, do proper content on TV. Then people will watch TV. Like you just watch that 8 o'clock to 9.30 belt on TV, it's really bad. And then comes a good, cool drama some time back, we all know the name, and there was a, a shift. Yeah, there is a discussion about the, whether the ratings were good and all that. Damn, screw that, man. People watch that drama because it was cool. You know, so content on our, our media should also disrupt. Maybe we'll get them next year and talk about uh, disrupting content because it's really sad. Thank you, Sugi. We'll note that for next time for sure. I think we need to have a disrupt Asia version for the advertising industry and then the media. Uh, and, 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 also, and also, I think next time you need to have uh, uh, like a pavilion for advertising agencies, make it a must for them to come. All right, well noted. I hope Ahmed is listening back there. <laughs> um, I think with this, uh, it opened up a really interesting um, uh, conversation also on monetizing. Um, now, this doesn't happen, happen here back at home at all. There's a lot of people that I know, very young, dynamic, extremely um, creative people creating a lot of content year on year basis and it's just stuck in their laptops. Sometimes it doesn't even come out on YouTube. It does um, if they're fearless. But I think the whole um, bottleneck also is uh, that we don't see on the panelists on stage today is um, the fear element. Fear of embracing something unknown, fear of embracing technology, fear of getting yourself into an unknown territory. Um, so that's, I think, where we need to disrupt first, like our heads. Uh, so I, I hope you guys would also uh, help the Sri Lankan creatives to get to where we deserve to be. Um, with that, I'd like to actually open up um, to the audience. If there are any questions that you want aimed at these panelists, now is your time. Uh, we have five minutes, basically, for Q&As. Uh, consumers hate ads. Like, there are a lot of platforms out there like Spotify and even Netflix where the premium services have no ads, even YouTube, where you pay extra, you don't get ads. How will uh, advertising and all of this data collection stuff work if consumers ideally won't be seeing any of it? This is for, 
see, the thing is this, right? <clears throat> Uh, it's, it's wrong to say consumers hate ads. Consumers hate bad ads. You know what I mean? Bad ads, you, you hate it. So if you start doing good advertising, people will watch it, okay? Back in the day, people loved, there was a good piece of work that was coming out back in the day I'm talking. So that is because that was the only form of entertainment, only form of medium which we were watching. So that happened. When the transition happened to digital and our mobile and all that, there was not proper transition of that creative piece coming into your mobile. So you can talk about Spotify and all these things, that is great, but the thing is that at the end of the day, a brand has a problem, brand wants to tell a story, and that good idea combined with the technology will create your super story or a super ad, which you can interact with it, you can share worthy ads. Uh, I was recently listening to an AD experience, A.R. Rahman song. And, and on the same day, on, like we all have multiple WhatsApp groups, right? So people were sharing that. Now imagine if someone did an AD experience radio ad for some brand and shared it. We would have picked up for sure. There was a piece of work that happened in Sri Lanka. I don't want to mention name. Uh, it was a 360 degree uh, TV ad uh, for the first time in the country. People watched it, people shared it, people loved it. So that is good advertising, which is embraced with technology. And you do some good stuff, that's all. It's, it's purely bad advertising is what we it's like, per, like you have a permanent ad blocker in your head, you know? You see a bad ad, no, I'm not going to watch that. You have a permanent blocker on your head that's like there. <laughs> and there's, uh, there's nothing to say that the content itself can't be the ad, right? Because yeah. I, uh, I was thinking about this thing that Microsoft Research did, where they wanted to reach out to scientists, programmers, and they realized that these guys read hard science fiction. So what they did was they collected some of the best hard science fiction writers of that era and wrote a book and got all of these guys to write a book. And at the heart of all these stories was Microsoft Research. Was, that was a brilliant way because that is content that people paid for and it is also advertising. Thank you. you and, now, and also just, just um, I wanted to show a video, we couldn't show it. Just, just YouTube, uh, the last uh, Rembrandt on YouTube and check it out. Uh, it's a new painting, uh, 400, year, uh, 400 years ago he died. Um, and there's a new painting by him using a new technology. Yeah, it's, it's a 3D printed yeah, amazing yeah, painting. So. Yeah. There was another question up front. Or oh, is that also answered now? Yes, we have a question at the back. Hi, this is for Sugi. Uh, I would just like to know what would be, what is the most effective platform of advertising uh, right now? TV. No, it's okay. No, 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 no. Uh, it's, it's really hard to, to say what, what is really good. It, it depends on the problem. It depends on the audience. You know, if I want to sell a diaper to a grandma, I'm not going to put it on digital, right? So, uh, uh, so it's like that. It, it, uh, but the fad and, and the truth maybe is, yeah, digital is, uh, uh, mobile is, is what you need to go for because you're going to get an audience which is very young, engaging, um, like back in the day, t radio was like, uh, you know, it's, it's always on. Now TV is on and you're watching your, f checking your phone, right? So just like that, it depends on the, it's, it depends on the audience so, uh, and, and on the problem, on the level of complex problems. So let's go with digital for disruptive yes. Thank you, Sugi. I think people are trying to mark their presence who represents the advertising industry in the audience right now. That's <laughs> so many questions coming to you. <laughs> Anyone else uh, with a question? We have one minute left, exactly, and we could use that. Uh, this is a question for Jeeva. Um, what, since you work at Machinima, what do you think makes a game really uh, impact the market? Like, what elements in a game do you see that make a game big? for like an indie game dev? 
I'm not a gamer, <laughs> but I'm gonna let you answer that question actually, because I'm not someone, I work at Machinima, and I depend on a lot of people like him who are actually uh, have their finger on the, the pulse of the culture. Um, but yeah, I'm, honestly, I'm not the right person to answer what makes a game good or not. Sure, so uh, I'll give an answer in a Sri Lankan context first. Um, a game has to be easily accessible, first of all, because if you're charging uh, $60 for a game in Sri Lanka, you're not going to get a lot of people playing it. Um, and, and in eSports, that's the biggest barrier to entry we've seen. We've, uh, so the uh, most popular game that is played these days is Call of Duty 4. All right, that's a 10-year-old game. There's a reason behind it. Uh, that is because people can access it easily and they can play it on their machines, which are, you know, 10-year-old machines. We have um, very active Overwatch, uh, CSGO um, scenes in Sri Lanka, but they're very small. That is because people don't want to shell out, you know, $30 on a game and uh, then have a 150,000 rupee PC that has to support 100, uh, you know, 200 FPS. Um, so th there is that big barrier of entry uh, for a game really hitting big numbers within Sri Lanka. On an international scale, it's a completely different answer. Um, it needs that X factor. I mean, like Fortnite got really, really popular because people watched other people playing it. PUBG got really, really popular because, uh, I mean, it was a really crappy game when it got released. It was really buggy. Uh, but it went viral because people were watching, you know, Let's Plays, people were playing it and streaming it, and it got really popular on Twitch. And then, you know, that, that, was their, that was their marketing strategy to get PUBG uh, really popular and to get people playing it. Because, you know, it, it was uh, a limited access release at the beginning. So, uh, person A would stream to 1,000 people, but th that 1,000 people really wanted to get that game, but they couldn't. So, there was high demand for it, and as soon as it was released, the numbers really skyrocketed. So, it, I mean, it's... it's there is no one answer. Each game gets popular for various different reasons. Dota 2 is popular for a different reason. It's a completely different strategy game. Uh, but I think Fortnite and PUBG, at the moment, bigger stream games uh, uh, got popular because of those reasons. Thank you, Ravin. I think with that, we need to um, wind up our session. Um, really interesting group of panelists we've had here tonight, and they'll be outside hanging around um, almost for the whole of the rest of the evening. So catch them, corner them, question them if you have more questions. Thank you, Pradeepa and gentlemen, for joining us for that very interesting discussion. And thank you for staying in with us. Have a good evening. Thank you.